and some of the international goals from the United Nations. But we're really happy to have our colleagues on the Ecology and Natural Resources uh, Advisory Committee to really transfer and really to really transfer the knowledge of information with for the protection of our natural resources. So with that being said, I'll pass the floor to Jessica Schuler, the chair of the City of Nourishell's Ecology and Natural Resources Advisory Committee. Jessica. Hi. Thank you, Paul. Happy Earth Day, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are, it's so great to see you, and um, we're all here together to make New Rochelle a little bit greener. And so I chair the Ecology and Natural Resources Advisory Committee, and we are working to care for the natural and living environment of our queen city of the sound. And so we have remarkable natural resources from the sound shore all the way up to Upland Forest and Ward Acres Park. And our team uh, works very closely with the city to enact our greener sustainability plan. And this is just a kickoff event and we hope that you can pick up on some action items from tonight and then also stay connected with us. We really wanna hear from you. We really wanna to work together on this. Um, so please, we're going to have a forum during the forum itself or after, uh, please fill out that survey and tell us what your interests are, what your questions are, and stay in touch, and we can all make New Rochelle greener. So thank you, and thank you, Paul. Before we introduce our first opening speaker, Mayor Noam Bramson, we'd just like to let you know that we do have this forum being translated into Spanish by Silvana Bahana. So if you want to hear this forum in Spanish, you can hit interpretation and then select Spanish. Um, I guess I'll say, tenemos esta presentación en español también. Es usted que prefiere la lengua de español. Tienes que oprimir interpretación y después español. So now our first opening speaker is our wonderful mayor for the city of Nourishell, the Honorable Noam Bramson. Uh, well, thanks very much for the introduction, Paul. It's a pleasure to, to be with you, and it's nice to see that there are quite a few people who have signed up and are, are joining us this evening. Um, my colleague Sarah Kay and I consulted uh, prior to the forum to make sure that our presentations would not be duplicative. And I'm happy to say from a selfish perspective that Sarah has agreed to do the heavy lifting and uh, speak in some detail about past actions that the city has taken in the sustainability field and, and future ambitions. So I have the comparatively much easier task of simply welcome everyone who is participating, uh, expressing special thanks to, to you, Paul, and Jessica, and all the volunteers on our advisory committees, as well as our partners at Sustainable Westchester. And, and of course, to say that we hope and intend that sustainability will become a more central part of the culture of city government and a more critical part of all of our lives. This is a challenge that is essential for both our community and our world, and we all have our parts to play. And I certainly hope that this forum will arm all of us with tools and suggestions and information uh, that permit us to do more. So thank you very much, and I look forward to a, an exciting discussion. Thank you, Mayor Bramson. We're happy to and proud to have your leadership here in the city of Nerschel. Our next speaker is the Honorable City Councilwoman, Sarah Kay. Sarah, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, and thank you, Noam, and Sustainable Westchester, and our communications department, and NRAC, and NCON, and all of the organizers who put together this incredible program. I know it's been a real labor of love, and I just want to thank everyone for making the time to listen in tonight. New Rochelle has long been a leader in environmental sustainability. So I'd like to begin by just giving a quick snapshot of our progress over the past 10 years and then share what the next phase could look like. Back in 2011, the City Council adopted Greener, a 20-year plan for achieving critical sustainability objectives by 2030. Now that we're at the 10-year mark, the City is about to refresh and comprehensively update the plan this year. New Rochelle was one of the first communities to participate in Westchester Power, a community choice aggregation program spearheaded by Sustainable Westchester, which delivers 100% clean energy to customers in our community. And the city's 10-year capital budget includes significant new investments in natural resources, like enhancing our local parks and improving water quality through sanitary sewer upgrades and projects like the restoration of Beachmont Lake. And by using smart growth strategies, and building badly needed housing downtown, 
The city's transit-oriented development reduces car dependency and requires less energy for the heating and cooling of our homes. And that's not all. The city swapped out all of our streetlights for LEDs. We have a free fully electric shuttle in the downtown. We created a greenhouse gas inventory and offer a free municipal tree planting program. Last week, the city launched a new app, Recycle Right, to answer all of your recycling related questions. We have two vibrant and active community gardens and a rain garden. And the city has partnered with Sustainable Westchester to bring several energy saving programs to residents, including community solar, grid rewards and energy smart homes, which you'll hear much more about later in the program. And just two days ago, the city council voted to adopt the stretch energy code, which will help to achieve higher energy efficiency standards in the construction and renovation of buildings, which is crucial in the fight against climate change. And yet there is still so much more work to be done, especially when we consider our sustainability goals through the lens of equity and justice. Low income communities of color have contributed the least to the climate crisis, yet they are disproportionately burdened by the polluting industries that are causing climate change and other environmental damage. They're also the most exposed to the impacts of climate change, like extreme heat and flooding. And it is structural racism that has historically caused these and in other environmental injustices. We must now focus more intently on climate justice and meaningful community engagement, which will help to ensure that environmental progress benefits our entire community. There is no denying we are in a climate emergency. It is hard not to feel overwhelmed or burned out by this great challenge, but we can no longer afford the luxury of feeling powerless. Instead, we can choose the future we wanna build. If we have learned anything from the past year grappling with a global pandemic, it is that our community is resilient and capable of mobilizing to protect the most vulnerable and to fight an invisible threat. It will require all of us to step up as individuals, as elected officials, and as a society to work together united by a shared sense of purpose. The solution to the climate crisis demands no less. Thank you. Councilwomen, we are really proud to have you as a representative on our city council and this forum will not have come about without your support. Our next speaker is the Honorable County Legislator, County Legislator Damon Marr, who represents the 10th County Legislative District on the Westchester County Board of Legislators. Um, County Legislator Marr, the floor is now yours. Uh, hello, I'm here over the phone. Can you hear me? Yes, we hello. can. Oh, okay. Hello. We hear you loud and clear. Oh, okay, thank you. I was told to be very brief. So, uh, thank you. Eat less meat, more fresh fruits and vegetables, in season, local if possible, and try to grow your own. Two, drive less, ride trains and buses more. Tell your local officials you want bicycle lanes so you and your children and grandchildren can bike safely. Three, spend more time outdoors. And so, heat and cool and light your house less. Four, support development of walkable neighborhoods. Five, recycle right. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Legislator Marr. We are proud to have you as a representative for the city of New Rochelle on the county board. And we do know that you actually are, you are walking the talk because we definitely know that you definitely are a man that is well known to be using your bike to get back and forth to White Plains. Our next speaker is our wonderful county executive, George Latimer. Um, County Executive Latimer, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Paul. And I certainly can't compete with Damon on the bicycle. So I, I surrender that particular advantage to him right off the bat. Um, the county government, like the city government, has very many things that we can do to help make things better. Some of it is uh, general policies and some of it is very specific things. Today, we opened uh, a composting facility uh, in our Grasslands uh, campus to serve as a model for local governments to have their own composting facilities where there's sufficient uh, land in those communities. And then also for us to be able to start a more robust food uh, waste recycling program to try to get food waste out of the garbage waste system uh, and to compost it in an environmentally sensitive way. We've got more work to do on that with water legislators and our administration uh, launch that today. We're working very hard to convert our bus fleet away from diesel buses to hybrid and electric. We've opened up charging EV charging stations in a number of places, and we have more to put online. We think that's an important element. Uh, we're looking at programs for solar collection 
in a number of different areas on the rooftops of our buildings, like the one I'm still sitting in here in White Plains, uh, and to do it also in carports and uh, uh, various parks and a host of other areas. I, I do want to tell an anecdote very quickly because it, it tells us that the, this issue isn't uh, an issue from today or yesterday. Today's Earth Day, and the first Earth Day was April 1970. That predates some of you being on the planet. I was in high school as a high school senior on April uh, 22nd of 1970. And I might add that that's about two months before you graduate from high school. So I had a bad case of senioritis. If you remember when you were a senior in high school, two months before graduation, I bet you had senioritis too. And I was, I remember this very distinctly. I was in uh, lunchroom fifth period. A friend of mine came and said to me, what are you doing after school? And I said, nothing. And he said, well, as a group of us are gonna be at this uh, field on the other side of my brother high school student, on the other side of the parkway, and we're gonna clean up the field. And I said, why would I wanna do that after school? That's work. And they said, he said to me, he says, well, there'll be girls there. Well, I said, count me in. Thus began my environmental commitment uh, to the society to go someplace where there were girls, you know, you're 17 years old. What motivates you at age 17? Um, but at that point in time, on that first Earth Day, we didn't think of the subtleties and the complications of having a clean environment. We had in those days smokestacks that you could see spewing effluent up into the air. We had pipes that came out of plants that went right into rivers. Uh, we had no environmental review process for development, none, none whatsoever. Um, we know now that, that we've corrected many of the, the problems in the environment and we recognize with global warming, we have an infinite number of more and it's gonna take us to change our lifestyle. And, and I don't mean to be facetious with Damon because he understands exactly how to lower his carbon footprint every day. But we all have to figure that. If I can't bike ride the way that he does, then I have to drive the kind of car that is powered in a way that doesn't use fossil fuels and absolutely right, conserving the amount of driving we do. So this forum is gonna be a great opportunity to talk about some of those areas. Those of us in public office have a chance to make an impact and we're gonna try our very best. And you as advocates will help us with good ideas and a little bit of pressure whenever it's needed. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much, County Executive Latimer. We're proud to have you as our representative. And I also wanna give a shout out to Peter McCart, the Westchester County um, Director of Energy Conservation and Sustainability, who is well known for saying that elections do have con consequences. And it's really up to us to make sure that we have our representatives government as being people that are very climate literate. And that's something that we are fortunate to have here in the city of New Rochelle on all levels of government. So our next speakers are gonna be some youth leaders that we have in the city of New Rochelle um, from the New Rochelle High School Green Club, um, Isabel Kamara, Anthony Baker, and Sarah Athair to talk about their Sustainable Cafeterias Initiative. Oh, Isabel, Anthony, and Sarah, the floor is now yours. Hi, um, we just need the slide to be switched so that we can begin. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we really appreciate your time in allowing us to discuss a pressing issue, which is dear to the hearts of many students in our generation. We are seniors at the high school going into environmental disciplines in college, and we've been very concerned with the way the city school district handles plastic waste. So here's a potential solution we formulated to this problem. The City School District of New Rochelle has a population of over 10,000 students. Pre-COVID, an average of 5,500 school meals are distributed each day across the district. Typically, a meal would come with a compostable food tray, plastic cutlery, plastic containers, or other harmful food wrap, like aluminum foil or at the high school compostable containers. Considering the above, we project plastic cutlery alone to nearly amass to 2 million discarded forks and spoons each year district-wide. Because plastics are non-biodegradable pollutants, the waste generated by just our school meals is colossal and concerning. And because the plastic cutlery is awkwardly shaped and is composed of different grades, they do not recycle. These undesirable plastics create havoc in the recycling facility because the optical scanning and mechanical sorting required in the material recovery facility cannot proceed properly for disposable cutlery. The school district took some action years ago with the help of Anna Giordano, the executive director of We Future Cycle. With her expertise and involvement, we now have a recycling system which has helped reduce garbage production at each of our schools by over 90%. New Rochelle High School alone generated 300 pounds of trash every single day before the recycling program was started. We now have 44 pounds of waste per day district-wide. 
Nearshaw is the only district in Westchester County to have garbage pickups twice a day. The two trips add up to a total of $200 per day, which ends up being very expensive over time and exasperates the pollution we generate. While We Future Cycle has made huge strides in promoting sustainability in the school district, we have to continue these efforts. As students who study the processes of our environment, we recognize that our cafeterias are not sustainable enough. Not only will our plan of promoting reusability help contribute to protecting our community and planet, but this project will teach our students about social responsibility and train them to become more aware environmentally, environmentally conscious citizens. At Trinity Elementary School, we could potentially begin our sustainable cafeteria program as a pilot, where current infrastructure is conducive to such a program and leadership has shown interest. There is a lot of science, environmental health, and civics education to be had if schools were intentional about involving the doing? community I'm in, the to in the process of moving towards sustainability. Furthermore, in a community as diverse as New Rochelle, we need to start the process of reconciling with environmental justice and acknowledging the prejudice impact of throwaway culture. Theoretically, our uh, district's carbon footprint can be reduced by practicing reusability through stainless steel forks, spoons, and other reusable kitchenware. Students would be given their containers and utensils on their tray, and after eating, items can be dropped off into a sanitizing tray containing a pre-rinsing solution. After each lunch period, cafeteria staff can take flatware to wash in an industrial grade dishwasher. Renovations to our cafeterias to install dishwashers in our schools is a crucial step to achieving sustainable cafeterias. Students simply discard their condiment packets after eating, but there is a way to avoid this harmful accumulation of waste by replacing these plastic and foil packets with bulk dispensers. Condiments can be treated like syrups at the schools in order to abide by state law for limiting calorie intake. Also in cafeterias, there is usually a container filled with plastic straws that students are allowed to take. We recognize that straws may be a necessity for some students with disabilities, but if schools can instead make straws available through request only, we can reduce our straw consumption. As previously mentioned, our re reusables would require sanitization systems that include a pre-rinsing solution drop-off and industrial grade washing machinery. The reusable materials would also be sorted, just like students already practice with recycling stations, in order to keep inventory. But to make this all happen, more labor and training from kitchen staff is required. It's also important to recognize that our reusable materials have a certain lifetime and would need to be replaced after a number of years. But these materials are much healthier for our planet than the plastics we currently consume are. Furthermore, according to Anna Giordano, the utilization of silverware equipment would be more effective than bamboo, bioplastics, or other disposable flatware, as proven by tests framed by We Future Cycle. Regardless, the efficacy of the sustainable cafeteria plan is contingent on a district-wide composting program, where such is only in practice at the high school, Barnard, and Trinity occasionally. Commercial sized dishwashers would be necessary in every school, around 10 across the district, and the inoperable washers and Trinity, Columbus, and Albert Leonard would need to be repaired. And please understand that these presented numbers are only estimates from sites to be referenced as we did not have access to most of the district's budget or company cost estimates for the installation of such equipment, as these are usually done through a contract or a bidding process. Our budget does not include the extra costs for electricity and water bills or any extra labor costs because of the limited amount of information we have regarding the district's potential sustainable cafeteria plan. There are grants provided by both the state and federal government that can help our school district moving forward. Although the system is an investment, including the renovation costs, the district would eventually be saving money in years to come with our system, let alone saving our community and planet. Making the necessary changes to combat climate change require investment now for future benefit. These include changes to our schools. Between the three of us, we are expected to pay around $300,000 for our college tuitions. School leaders ask us to invest our time, energy, and money in our academics for our future benefit, and we simply ask them to make a similar investment. Members of the community, we ask for your support in this campaign by signing our petition and holding our administration accountable and pressuring officials to make the right choice for the students and the planet. To school leaders, would you work with us to develop a proposal and present it to the Board of Education by the end of the school year, potentially a pilot program at Trinity Elementary School? With a plan like this, New Rochelle can be a model and set a precedent that a large school can be eco-conscious. We have heard the arguments against sustainable cafeterias, that it's too expensive or too ambitious, but we have science and justice on our side. This is the right thing to do for the health of our school and our communities, and it's the right thing to do to be an anti-racist school district and the right thing to do if we want to become a sustainable city that restores, not destroys our environment. This is not a new solution. 
It is simply the, the way things used to be. Why are we holding this generation to a different standard at a time of crisis? Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony, Isabel, and Sarah for your leadership in Nersha High School and showing the potential found within our school district to support citywide initiatives in sustainability. Um, we're happy to have you and we look forward to supporting you as well. Um, please sign a petition, anyone that's on the Zoom that is now in the chat, the link is there and we'll like to help them to make sure that they bring this into reality. Um, our next presenter is my colleague at Sustainable Westchester, Lauren Boyce, who is the Director of Energy Smart Homes, and also Claire Kokoska, who is the Manager of our Community Solar Program. So I guess the floor is now um, your, um, yours. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. So um, we can go. To, perfect. So hi, everyone. As Paul said, I'm Lauren Bruce, and I'm happy to be joining you. So a little bit about Sustainable Westchester is that we are a nonprofit consortium of Westchester County governments, and it's our goal to enable sustainability programming to help ensure a better future for our communities. So Sustainable Westchester is a nonprofit, as I had mentioned, and we have um, membership from our municipalities. So pretty much every single municipality in Westchester County is a member, including Westchester County itself. And of course, New Rochelle is a member of Sustainable Westchester. And we provide our members with a series of programs and opportunities for municipalities and residents to get involved with. So on the next slide, you'll see a whole bunch of different programs that we offer. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Energy Smart Homes New Rochelle. We're going to touch on an easy energy action, grid rewards, and community solar. But we just want to let you know that Westchester Power is also a program of Sustainable Westchester. So as Sarah had mentioned in her earlier remarks, many residents in Nurshell are receiving their electricity supply through the Westchester Power program, which means you are getting 100% renewable energy. And it's great to be supporting um, the growth of local of renewable energy. And if you're wondering, hey, what's the supply coming from? It's 100% fossil fuel free hydroelectric produced in upstate New York. That's just a little note about Westchester Power. You'll get letters in the mail once in a while from Westchester Power. So just like to mention that it's one of our programs. We also have a program that is providing solar panels with a backup battery through the virtual power plant or VPP. So if you're thinking about getting solar panels at your house or if you're interested in getting a battery, please visit the Sustainable Westchester website for more information on that. And our website has a whole host of information as well as helping people transition to um, electric vehicles. So if you're in the market to buy a new EV, head on over to the Sustainable Westchester website for more info. So let's get right into Energy Smart Homes, which has been in the city of New Rochelle for a few years now under different names. So formerly known as Energize New Rochelle, Energy Smart Homes is a program that can help residents to make their homes more energy efficient. So if you feel like your house is really drafty in the winter time or really sweltering hot in the summer, or you have high utility bills during either seasons, you may benefit from a home energy assessment. So I've got some specific slides about that. We'll look at what is a home energy assessment, but another component of this is also thinking about clean heating and cooling. So just as people are thinking about transitioning from gas powered cars to electric vehicles, we really want to do the same thing in our home. So if your oil burner or your natural gas system is on the fritz and you're thinking, hey, it's time to get a new heating system, perhaps you don't want to get another fossil fuel based system. Maybe it's time to think about doing a heat pump, which can come in the form of an air source or a ground source heat pump. So this slide's got a little preview of the different technologies Sustainable Westchester can help you to navigate. We have a list of partner contractors that we recommend and can provide one specific technology or a combination of the two. And the contractors on our list have been vetted by local volunteers helping to pick the best contractors that have applied to work with Sustainable Westchester. And all of our contractors also work with Con Ed and NYSERDA. NYSERDA is the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority that provides the backbone for most of the programs that I'll be talking about. And you may wonder, hey, well, what is NYSERDA? 
it's a program that we all pay into with our utility bills. So I will be mentioning in this presentation free assessment, rebates, incentives, but really we are collectively paying into this system through our utility bill. Next time you get your bill, you can take a look. There's a little fee at the bottom that says SBC charge, which is going to fund NYSERDA. So I point this out to say, take advantage of these programs and opportunities because you might as well. So let's just go into the next slide and we can take a look. Okay, so home energy efficiency. This is talking about making sure your house is sealed up nice and tight with more insulation and air sealing. Next slide. I've got a lot of slides in this presentation. I move pretty fast, but I like for people to see the pictures. So um, having a home energy assessment, a contractor will come to your house for a series of diagnostic testing to take a look to see where your house is wasting energy and where it can be improved. And through the Comfort Home Pilot Program, um, the average income earner can earn between $500 and $4,000 in rebates to add insulation, get new windows, do air sealing. A lot of the programs that NYSERDA offers are based off of someone's income level. So you'll see on the next slide, I think we have assisted home performance. So if you are a homeowner in the city of New Rochelle that is receiving the enhanced star property tax exemption, you can actually qualify for even more incentives and rebates from NYSERDA of $5,000. And I've included the income limitations on this slide. You could take a screenshot of it. We also have the info on our website and I'll be happy to talk more about it when the presentation is over. You can give us a call at the office too. But just to get a taste of what's out there, the third program is called Empower New York. And this is for people that are renters in apartments, homeowners of houses, owners of condos, really you could be a renter or an owner to do the Empower program. And this benefits people that are receiving SNAP, HEAP, um, are participating in programs like that or are below 60% of the area and median income. And I included the limitations here as well. So if you know someone that could benefit from up to $10,000 of free home energy upgrades, including a free heat pump, please send them our way. We'll be happy to get them signed up. And I think I'm going over my time, so I should probably move a little faster. <laughs> So air source heat pumps are a good fit for people that do not have duct work in their house. Sorry, James, keep, keep clicking. Um, there's rebates and incentives from Con Ed for that. Ground source heat pumps are a good fit for people that do have duct work in their home or are thinking about installing the ducts. And if you have been thinking how you want central air in your home for many years, ground source heat pump is a good way to go. It provides summertime cooling, wintertime heating, and it's actually more affordable to install a ground source heat pump system to gain central air conditioning than it is to install your typical type of air conditioning system. Um, and heat pump hot water heater, you know, we have to replace these every 10, oh, thanks Paul. <laughs> we have to replace our heat pump hot water, our hot water heaters more frequently. So you may be thinking, hey, I need a new heat pump hot water heater. I need a new one. So Con Ed has a $1,000 rebate on the heat pump hot water heater, which is typically a little bit more expensive than a regular hot water heater, but it's two to three times more efficient. So you really get a good payback in the savings that way. And we have some upcoming events if you're wanting to learn more about what we're talking about. We, for anyone that's tuning into the presentation tonight in Spanish, we'll be doing an in-depth dive to all the sustainable Westchester programs on May 12th. And we'll be doing a virtual house tour on May 20th. So we invite anyone on this call to tune in and meet some Westchester neighbors who are living in passive houses, living in homes with heat pumps and saving energy and living more comfortably. So now we're going to talk about two different easy energy actions to take represented by community solar and grid rewards. And I may be the ones telling you about this because my colleagues are on another Earth Day event. So, um, some of Lauren, us we okay. just hopped in. We literally we're just came here. in. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Happy Earth okay. Day. Happy Good. Earth Day. We're Zoom hopping tonight. So Claire, are you going to tell us about community solar? I am. I am. So Community Solar is a really exciting um, new solar program that allows anyone, not just homeowners with financing in place and perfectly positioned rooftops to benefit from solar. Um, next slide, please, James. 
but anyone with a Con Ed bill without solar panels already on their roof uh, can join the program. That includes homeowners and renters, people in apartments and condos. Um, there are solar community solar farms built typically on large rooftops and uh, people will join that specific community solar farm, which sends its power to the local electric grid, making the electricity that all of us use much, much greener. And for supporting that solar farm, everyone gets a discount on their electric bill every month. Well, everyone that's signed up to the community solar program. So to go over quickly how, um, and just back one, James, please. To quickly go over how the savings itself works, you would join a community solar farm and based on your average electric usage, we give you, we designate a portion of the community solar farm to you. And every month as that portion of the solar farm generates power, you earn a solar credit. Um, and then your community, so your solar credit appears on your Con Ed bill as a negative number and you pay a much lower amount to Con Ed. And then you will auto pay your solar farm for that solar credit at a 10% discount. So every single month you'll earn a solar credit that vastly lowers your Con Ed bill, sometimes to zero. And then you pay the solar farm for that solar credit at a 10% discount. Um, we liken it to buying a $100 gift card for $90. And the end game is that you save every month. Next slide, please. To quickly go over the benefits of community solar, you are saving 10%, up to 10% off your electricity bill each and every month very consistent savings by supporting local renewable energy in the form of these solar farms um, that you and your neighbors can all join together. There's no solar installation on your property, no wires to your home or your apartment or anything like that. There's no cost to join and no cost to cancel if you ever need to cancel because life changes. Um, and it's compatible with any energy supplier. Some of you might have Westchester Power or Con Ed as your electricity supplier or others. Community Solar is an additional um, renewable energy program. You can join on top of that for additional savings. So I am going to keep it quick and simple with that community solar explanation and pass it along to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Claire. Grid efficiency, well, it implies that the grid is inefficient, right? So we try to make it more efficient. Why is that? Next slide, James is that because we are currently relying on peakers sometimes in the summer, when it's hot, when everyone is turning on the AC, there's a huge demand on the, on the system. It stresses the grid such that we had to co-locate some of these generation inside the, 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 you know, the communities. And we have peakers in uh, places like Queens and, and Brooklyn, Yonkers and Bronx where mostly our, our disadvantaged communities are located as well. And these, what we call dirty peakers, because they're dirty, they are generating just for a few hours a, a year during high demand, they're producing a lot of uh, bad emissions, uh, including carbon dioxide, noxious and soxious, as we call them, and they're unhealthy. They create unhealthy conditions around them. Next slide, James. How are we going to do something about this? Well, it's an easy one. Easy one, why just download an application, we call that Grid Rewards, uh, and that application will help you uh, connect with the Yukon Edison account. Mind you, you have to have a Con Edison account and, and, and you, you have to have the credential to access that Con Ed account to be able to connect Grid Rewards to your Con Ed account. So you can start earning cash. Earning cash how? Well, very you know, few times during the summers when the, the temperature is going up like above 95 degrees, when all these ACs are running, um, you're gonna get notification through this app. Um, two hours in advance, 21 in advance, but just a few times, like four or five days during the summer. And then all you need to do, next slide, is to go around, you know, that the house and just enter, enter, James, and then I'll go around the house and shed the, the loads, shed the loads. One way of doing so is 
turn up your thermostat by four or five degrees such that your AC is not going to kick in. And you can go around the house. And that application, once you've downloaded it, will tell you what to do. There's a list of action to take just a few times during the summer. At the end of the summer, you get cash. You get a check in the mail. And that check in the mail was in average last summer when we ran a pilot, about $200. It's worth the money. It's worth the exercise. And not only that, it helps you help uh, getting rid of these dirty peakers, as we call them. Uh, one thing you have to know, we'll explain more in length, how to sign up is to have your ConEd account online credentials. It is important because you need to connect these two uh, platform systems here. And all you need to do is be ready. If the temperature goes up, be ready. It will be most of the time a, a signal for you to like check your iPhone and mobile phone. You still can sign up on this uh, great rewards program on your PC as well. But you, you, you have to somehow check your email because that's the only way we can get to you. iPhone is the best thing because we are pushing notification like a text message or something like that to your system, to your iPhone so you can be ready. Um, next slide. I guess this is uh, for the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really proud of the work being done by my colleagues at Sustainable Westchester, showing us the economic prosperity found within these programs for the protection of our shared natural resources through the lens of environmental economics. So really happy to really help get the word out to residents of New Rochelle so that we can really meet some of those New York State and international climate goals. Our next presentation is going Wait, to be- Wait, Paul, can I just say one yeah, more thing? Yeah, of course. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I just wanted to give some context around why we want to tell our New Rochelle neighbors to sign up for programs like Grid Rewards and Community Solar. So not only would you be helping yourself to save money on your electricity bills and the good work of reducing your carbon footprint, but the city of New Rochelle is participating in a program called Clean Energy Community. So if we are to get 25 signups for each program that you heard about tonight, Energy Smart Homes, Community Solar, Grid Rewards, the city of New Rochelle can get $15,000 for each one of those campaigns. So that's $15,000 the city can use towards clean energy programs. And we definitely want to encourage people to sign up. I was on a call earlier today and um, one of the participants said, yeah, during the call, I, I did my grid rewards application in five minutes. And it looks like James signed up too. So please tell your neighbors and your friends hey. it's doing good times triple. So thanks. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yes, please sign up, everyone. Uh, so just to continue with our program, our next speaker is New Rochelle resident Millie McGraw, who is going to be talking about sustainable landscapes, how to turn your lawn into a sustainable, sustainable landscape with native plants, pollinated gardens, no the, uh, transition away from leaf blowers, leaf management, healthy yards, composting barrels, and rain barrels. So a lot of interesting items of discussion. So Millie, I guess the floor is now yours. Great, thank you so much, Paul. And wow, this has been um, such a fantastic event so far. Um, so yeah, it's a lot for me to cover in not so much time. So I'm gonna be breezing through some of this stuff, but there is um, at the end of my presentation, a few pages of resources that will have a lot more information about all of the topics that I'm covering. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Millie McGraw. Um, I live in New Rochelle and I'm talking about sustainable landscapes. Um, so most of this short presentation is gonna be geared towards uh, people who have some land on which to like plant things. Um, for those of you who don't, I hope that there'll be some parts of the presentation that you'll find interesting anyway. Um, I also work for the county and in that position, part of what I do is I'm co-coordinator of the soon to be launched Planting Westchester program, a pro program that was initiated by our county executive. Um, the other co-coordinator of this program with me is uh, Nikki Coddington and she's a volunteer who lives in the river towns. So just, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Planting Westchester. Um, and so what is it? Uh, Planting Westchester provides or soon will provide people who live and work in the county with an easy to follow comprehensive resource 
on how to plant and maintain everything, really everything. And through GIS mapping, we'll connect people from around the county so that we can all learn from each other and grow from one another. Um, the first phase of planting Westchester is an educational website and it's chock full of everything one would wanna know about growing and maintaining trees and plants. It's an easy to follow toolkit with a local bent toward, um, with a local bent to it. And so there's an emphasis on facing some of the tough issues that the county, um, addressing some of the tough issues that the county is facing. So, you know, climate change, food security, heat islands and restoring natural habitats. So what's covered on the website are these eight topics that you see here. Um, so say you wanna start a vegetable garden, you'll be able to go to Backyard Vegetables and Fruits page and learn about you know, how to determine where your garden should be, the size of your garden, when to plant, how much sun do you need, where to plant and, and so much more. And then you can hop over to the soil health page and learn about why soil health matters and how to get your soil tested and how to amend your soil, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's like pages and pages of really easy to follow um, resources for the beginner. Um, and close to a hundred volunteers, some of whom I recognize on this. Um, so thank all of you have spent many an hour developing some text and carefully curating resources of videos, articles, books, other websites um, that are gonna be on the website. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're just kind of trying to put the best ofs in one location. Um, next slide. Phase two of planting Westchester is just to map on the county's fantastic GIS system, all the current and existing projects um, and then new projects that come in. And this will include information about the project how to connect um, folks who, who've done that project. Um, it will be really easy to search. So say for instance, you wanna start a pollinator pathway in your community or a tree drive, you'll be able to go onto the GIS system to see who in the county has done something similar to what you're envisioning. And then you can talk and learn from people who have done it, what worked, what didn't work. Um, as I said, no one reinventing the wheel. Um, next slide. So that's planting Westchester and part of planting Westchester is, you know, focusing on healthy yards, focusing on native plants, which was one of the topic committees and um, invasive species, which was another one. So, you know, what's a healthy yard? Many people think that a healthy yard is one that's like this heavily manicured, expansive yard with the grass cut really short <clears throat> without a single errant weed or leaf. Um, I don't. I think of a healthy yard as a yard that causes no harm to living creatures. And in fact, as a yard that sustains life. A healthy yard has healthy soil that's teeming with biological life. It's a yard that's free of toxic pesticides and herbicides, which, you know, they're designed to kill living organisms. Um, many pesticides and herbicides are known carcinogens. They're linked to birth defects, to liver and kidney damage, to endocrine disruptions, I, I can go on. They contaminate our water, including our drinking water. They're toxic to fish and insects and mammals and birds. Um, studies have shown that they drift into our homes. They contaminate the air we breathe in our homes, our sur the surfaces. And, and because you know children are growing and developing, their exposure rate is 10 times that of adults. Oh, and they harm our dogs and cats too. Um, and so like the crazy thing about all this is that healthy soil, the time teeming with, um, with life, that supports the development of like a healthy grass that's naturally resistant to weeds and pests. So getting rid of the pesticides and the herbicides, not only will it save you money, but it's also better for your health, the health of your children, your pets, all living organisms, and it's better, better for your grass too. Um, next slide. Next slide, James. Thanks. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about insects. Um, so for a few reasons, which I'll discuss in a second, a minimum of 40% of the insect species are in, are in decline, many of which are now endangered, 40%. 
it's, it's hard to be precise about this, but there are studies in the United States and abroad that have come to the same conclusions. And just sort of based on my own anecdotal evidence, like when I was growing up, there were, you know, um, there were all sorts of like fireflies everywhere and ladybugs and, you know, now, now not so much. And so this ladybug featured here, the nine spotted ladybug, it was once the most common ladybug in the country. And in fact, it was so revered for suppressing pets that it became the official New York state insect. Um, and now it's endangered. But so like, who cares? Why does this matter? Well, um, uh, next slide. So, oh, actually, sorry, go back. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. So, so why does it matter? Well, you know, insects, the bees, the butterflies, the ladybugs, the moths, the beetles, other flies, etc. they pollinate about 70% of the flowers, about 40% of our food crop. Without insects, our food crop would be decimated. And they're the foundation of the food chain for the fish and the birds and the mammals. Without them, there's nothing for the birds and the fish to eat. And then there's nothing for the mammals to eat. And then like simply put without insects, we don't have fruit, we don't have vegetables, we don't have fish and we don't have mammals. So like there's nothing for us to eat then either. So insects really matter. Um, <clears throat> oh, and one other thing that's really cool about insects, you know, they do return the nutrients to the earth. So if they weren't around, there'd be all this decay and rot and that would be like really disgusting too. So at any rate, um, insects are like super important. Um, so next slide. So why are they in danger? Well, you know, scientists say there are a few reasons, you know, deforestation, um, development. So, you know, eliminating their habitats. Um, you know, that's, that's a huge reason. Climate change, you know, these critters have evolved over hundreds of millions in, of years and rapidly shifting in temperature and in precipitation that affect and change their habitat. They can't adapt that quickly to that. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why they're in decline. I mean, there are a gazillion examples of that. Um, as we just talked about, pesticides and herbicides, there are chemicals that exist to kill. That's one reason why they're in decline. And then the other reason why they're in decline is invasive species. So insects have evolved over all of these hundreds of millions of years by living among native plants, plants native to where they have evolved. And there's this guy and he's listed in the resources, Doug Tallamy, he's an entomologist from the University of Delaware and he's done a ton of research and his research has proven that non-native plants, invasives, don't have natural predator, predators and thus they outcompete the native plants. And most plants can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions, but insects can't. So insects tend to be kind of specialists. They feed on and pollinate a narrow spectrum of plant life, sometimes just a single species. And Ptolemy says, quote, 90% of the species that eat plants can develop and reproduce of the, in sorry, 90% of the insects that eat plants can develop and reproduce only on plants with which they share an evolutionary history. So if they haven't shared these hundreds of millions of years with these plants, the insects don't have anything to eat. Um, and this is even true of like closely related species. So, um, so an imported Norway maple versus a native sugar maple. The insects won't thrive with a Norway maple, but they will with the sugar maple. And so, um, so for instance, Ptolemy has found that within the same genus, introduced plant species invasives provide on average 68% less food for insects than natives. So invasive species and a decrease in natives also really contributes to one of the reasons why we don't have as many insects. Um, next slide. So what can we do about all of this? Well, one thing we can do, we can reduce your carbon footprint, footprint with some of the really cool energy saving tips that we heard about from SW. 
Another thing we can do is we can plant more native plants and we can create pollinator pathways, which are pathways of native plants all around the county um, in the Northeast and actually around the country that provide good habitats for insects. And there's a pollinator pathway link um, in your resources as well. Um, and you know, since um, native plants evolved in the local environment, they usually need a lot less care, such as fertilizer and pesticides. They usually don't need any fertilizers or pesticides that you know, the non-native plants need. And native plants require you know, less water too. Um, what else can we do? We can avoid pesticides and herbicides, which I've already talked about. Um, you can reduce the size of your lawn. And, you know, you can plant more native plants and shrubs and ground covers where your lawn has been. Um, and that's also really good for flooding and soil erosion too. Uh, you can get rid of your leaf blower. It's not only bad for your ears and annoying, but it's a huge pollutant. It's equivalent to the, that of the emissions of a car or more. And it sends all sorts of nasty particulates into the air like fecal matter and mold and pesticides and lead and the particulates can remain suspended in the air for hours. Leaf, glass powered leaf blowers cause asthma and bronchitis and lung disease and other lung disease. They disturb the, um, the insects. You know, they're like blowing really hard right on this poor little caterpillar trying to cling to its leaf and the leaf blower is blasting it. Um, and they erode valuable topsoil. So you can stop using a leaf blower. And what can you do instead? Well, you can, do the practices of love them and leave them. Um, you can, which means you leave your leaves on your lawn, you mulch them. They're, it's a mower with a particular type of blade that mulches the leaves. You leave them there and then the mulch leaves will add valuable nutrients to your soil, making it even healthier. Next slide. Next slide, James. You can remove invasive species like the English ivy climbing up this tree that basically, you know, if it hasn't already, is gonna choke and kill the tree. So if you see ivy climbing up trees, you might think, oh, it looks so pretty. You know, cut the vines, it's gonna knock your tree down, it's gonna kill it. Um, and you can learn how to, you know, like get rid of all other invasive species and just start planting more natives. Um, you can start composting, it's really easy. You just, you get a compost bin, you throw in your browns, your brown leaves, your greens, your food scraps. Um, you don't do meats or oils. You stir it occasionally and voila, you start to create compost. You use that on your soil. It's good for your soil. It's good for your pocketbook because you're creating your own compost. You don't have to go buy it. Um, you can start growing your own food using the compost that you've just created. Um, and, you know, grow your own food and, start taking care of yourself that way. It tastes better and uh, it will save you money. And finally, um, you can get a rain barrel. The county does, they just finished a sale, but the county does do um, compost and rain barrel sales. And so you can get a rain barrel and you can start to collect rain for your garden. And so you can save money on your water bill and stop being so wasteful with water. So that's my very quick version. The resources that I've supplied, um, are pretty lengthy and good and they give you a little description about what it is and uh, they'll be shared and um, you know if you have any questions you can reach me at the county um, again my last name is McGraw thank you all very much thank you so much Millie for this invaluable information in environmental education on things that any resident in New Rochelle can do to support climate resiliency in the city of New Rochelle uh -huh. we're happy to have you as our neighbor here in New Rochelle so uh, before we go and introduce our next speaker, I'd we'll like to share with you that we are having an engagement survey for all of our participants here, just so that we can really maximize and opening channels of communications and your accessibility to the Green NR advisory committees. So you can identify if there's any specific issues you want to follow up on, um, any specific programs that call your interest, or and we are also taking the initiative to identify environmental justice issues to really start sharing those and streamlining those with some of our legislative leaders on all levels of government. But really take a time, it was posted in the chat by um, Lauren Bryce. So feel free to, um, to you know, save that link, share it with your neighbors, share it with your email list, and really make sure that you are able to be 
aware of what we're doing so that we could continue to coalition build and really make and really meet some of these goals for the city of Nershell and um and uh, renewable energy and overall climate resiliency. So our next speaker is Teresa Medivire, the um, the membership director for the Business Council of Westchester's Green Business Partnership. Teresa is going to be talking about how to become a certified green business and show your employees, clients, clients, and communities that you care about sustainability through the Green Business Partnership. Thank you for joining us, Teresa. Good evening, everyone. Happy Earth Day. I'm Teresa Metibear, Membership Director at the Green Business Partnership. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. We at GBB, GBP want to build a future where all people and communities have equitable access to a safe, clean, healthy, and nourishing environment. We believe that businesses play a critical role in this process. So our mission is to engage, educate, and empower organizational leaders and staff to accelerate sustainable business practices. Simply because the day-to-day -day operations of businesses and employees has an impact on our environment and implementing measures to reduce the impact collectively can make a positive difference. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Green Business Partnership is in partnership with the Business Council of Westchester and Westchester County Government. We are now 12 years old. The Green Business Partnership helps organizations realize what sustainability means to them and how to be responsible and successful at the same time. It's important to step back and look at the benefits of sustainable business to your own organization and to society at a large. We all want to reduce the impact on the environment, but being sustainable also helps your business to save money by consuming fewer resources. Studies show that not only young people, but older generations want to work for businesses where the leadership and their colleagues care about the environment the health of their employees and about their impact on their local communities. Incorporating sustainable practices into business operations is a great engagement tool for staff. You can form a green team who work together on an issue they deeply care about and get the opportunity to share their passion and educate others within your business and in community. Businesses that operate sustainably can inspire others in the industry and communities to follow their lead. Customers and clients increasingly want to shop and work with businesses that demonstrate their values. Operating sustainably and measuring your business's impacts helps your business to stay ahead of regulations and qualify for state and federal funding and incentives. The Green Business Partnership has more than 160 members and 65 have achieved green business certification. I will quickly show three slides with certified member logos. We are so proud of this diverse group and you may recognize a few in your community. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. We've made the process as simple as possible while still ensuring that those who become certified develop a deep understanding of the principles of sustainability and make changes that are truly impactful. So the first step is we declare commitment to staff and recruit your green team. Two, complete required actions in seven areas of operations. Three, perform greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Four, submit final presentation for review and approval. Five, you get certified. And once you're certified, you'll have a whole host of opportunities to spread the word about your commitment to sustainability and being an officially green certified business. We focus on seven key areas, organizational commitments, energy, transportation, land use, 
water, waste and recycling, green purchasing, as well as refrigerants. And within each, there are specific actions for you to take in order to earn certification. We are in the process of adding real-time energy and indoor air quality metrics to the platform and integrating with Energy Star Portfolio Manager to allow for benchmarking. Beyond engagement within your business, we offer many opportunities to learn from, collaborate with, and be more visible to other green business leaders. It's amazing how we can learn from each other and inspire one another during our virtual meetings. We know that figuring out, figuring out where to start can be the hardest part. So we've created a way for you to dip your feet in and learn about the, pro the process. We're hosting a free virtual training session on May 4th at noon. It's one hour, very informal, and I promise it will be worth your time. The session will be focused on organizational commitments, the big picture goals, and the buy-in which is really the foundation you need in order to become more sustainable. This session is part of a four-part series that we usually offer only to members. But today's attendees are invited to attend this first one for free with no obligation to continue any further. During this session, you learn about setting environmental policies, how to create a green team, and communicating your sustainability goals with your organization. Whether or not you decide to become a member of GBP, after the training, you'll gain an understanding of what it takes to become a green business and how to get started. You can register online at www.greenbusinesspartnership.org and just click on events. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. So basically for our next section of our program, we're gonna be talking about volunteer opportunities. Uh, for the city of uh, New Rochelle and all of our residents. Uh, I just shared a link in our chat. It was a Google Doc that was put together by um, James Mum, um, the, um, the, camp, the campaign's director for Greenpeace USA, as well as his colleagues on the energy, um, the in, Ecology and Natural Resources Advisory Committee. Um, really just putting transparency on upcoming events this weekend and also things that are happening that you could you know, get involved with and support. We have a lot of great things happening this weekend and we hope to see you there to really um, be more engaged in the community. And hopefully we can establish a culture of really having these events happening year round. Every day is Earth Day and it's really important that we really start having that cultural shift towards you know, having this as a regular form of conversation or a regular event that we have throughout the calendar year. So please take a moment to share that, to, to copy that link, save that link that I placed in the chat. Let me place it one more time so that you can save it, share it with your colleagues, and then be more involved in becoming the local steward in the city of New Rochelle, because we definitely do need your help. So I guess we're approaching the end of our program right now. And I really just want to say that it really was a collaborative effort. This was a lot of planning, a lot of Zoom calls. I know I missed a couple of meetings, but we're really happy to have come together and really put this together for the city of New Rochelle during such a crucial time. Um, you know, we do see a shift that's happening um, on, on an international level and a national level in terms of really taking our climate emergency very, very serious. And we really need to take a focus and, re and really know that we have a little bit of privilege here in the city of New Rochelle because we have community leaders that have a strong background in environmental sciences. And we also have government leaders that really get what's happening. Um, you know, All throughout the world, you have people that are protesting to have government leaders to take this climate um, emergency serious and to help with presenting legislation. But here in New Rochelle, we kind of have the antithesis of that. We have government leaders that are looking for people to help them in the advocacy, especially with our young leaders. And I really wanna stress the importance of Anthony, Isabel and Sarah's presentation from New Rochelle High School, because there's a lot of potential that's there. Um, I saw earlier on social media, that was there was a post that was made by Peter McCart, our, our Westchester County Government Director of Energy Conservation and Sustainability about the Elmsford School District making a declaration to go climate neutral now and carbon neutral by 2030. And we could really start expanding conversations to really have that done in New Rochelle, because after all, we are the Queen City of the Sound and really had to 
take that leadership charge for Southern Westchester and all around environmental quality and the protection of our natural resources and transitioning towards that green economy and green, green potential that we have here in New Rochelle. So I guess just to close out, I'm really happy that all of you took the time to join us. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, I don't know if we wanna do a quick team picture of, of all of us together. I don't know how that works, um, but I'm really happy that all of you took the time to join us today. So, Everybody, if you wanna be in a picture, smile and wave for half a second. Ready? We're taking a picture one. I have to do it a few times because we got a lot of people on this call. So great. Okay. Got it. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for hosting. Happy Earth Day. Yay. Happy Earth Day. Earth Day. Good job, Green. New Rochelle. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Good job, Millie. Good night, everyone. Good night.